Today we're going to do a bonus lesson where we're going to go over some hymns that are not part of the book we've been studying from, Singing with the Understanding. These are some hymns we're going to go over today that I've been thinking about have what I'm going to call old phrases, old-fashioned phrases that is not of our not part of our everyday language and I thought maybe it might be some hymns that maybe you hadn't thought of in this way so we're going to review four hymns today and um, learn a little bit more about them and see if you've been singing them with the understanding so this isn't part of the book that we've been doing. These are This is a bonus lesson for different hymns we're going to go over today. So I'm Catrice Howard. This is the New Hope Road Church of Christ Ladies Bible Lesson we've been doing on hymns. And I have really, truly enjoyed it. And I appreciate very much those who've reached out to me and said that they thought the classes were very helpful which is the whole point. I want these classes to be helpful. I hope that they are encouraging and somewhat instructive and being helpful to you. That's the whole point. So let's um, start today and we're going to start with a hymn that, have your Bible with me, we're going to start with a hymn that I really don't remember reading, very, I mean singing very often. Uh, in the congregations I've been a part of, but this is a hymn called Beulah Land and written by Edgar Page. So let me first tell you about Edgar Page. Edgar Page Stites, S-T-I-T-E-S, born in 1836 and he died in 1921. He was born in New Jersey he served during the Civil War. He was a riverboat pilot on the Delaware River. He wrote this hymn, Beulah Land. Let me read the verses to you. I've reached the land of love divine, and all its riches freely mine. Here shines one undimmed, here shines undimmed one blissful day, for all my night has passed away. Verse 2. A sweet perfume upon the breeze is born from ever vernal trees, and flowers that never fading grow where streams of life forever flow. The zephyrs seem to float to me sweet sounds of heaven's melody, as angels with the white robed throng join in the sweet redemption song. That was verse 3. Here's the refrain. O Beulah land, sweet Beulah land, as on thy highest mount I stand, I look away across the sea where mansions are prepared for me, and view the shining glory shore, my heaven, my home, forevermore. Now, that is a hymn where he has taken the word Beulah, which we find used only one time in the Bible. Let's turn to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 62, and we're going to read verse 4. It says, Isaiah 62 verse 4, You shall no longer be termed forsaken, nor shall your land any more be termed desolate. But you shall be called Hezba, and your land Beulah, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. So the word Beulah actually means married. So this is where in the book of Isaiah, God is letting his people know that they will be redeemed. And so that's where he got the, the term Beulah from, which is only one time here in Isaiah. So it's obvious by what we've read in the helm, he's using Beulah land to, um, 
refer to heaven, that that's, that is, and of course, hymn writers use poetic language and they, they have that ability to, um, to write in poetic terms. And so this, this hymn is actually, uh, talking about my heaven, my home forevermore. So that is what he is calling Beulah land. Never, never thought of that before. Didn't, um, didn't think of the word Beulah all that much. So that is a hymn that maybe is, uh, maybe not sung as much and, uh, is kind of a hymn with older phrases that aren't used. Um, as much. Okay, let's do another helm. This helm, this is a helm we do sing, um, but let's see that we understand exactly what the hymn is talking of. This is the helm bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. This helm was written by Knowles Shaw. We've spoken of him before. He was a, a very enthusiastic, very hardworking preacher for the Disciples of Christ. And uh, he lived from 1834 to 1878. He actually died in a train wreck. We had spoken of that. He died in a train wreck going to a revival. Um, and he wrote a lot of very beautiful, encouraging hymns. And this is one of them, Bringing in the Sheaves. Let's read the verses in the refrain. Sowing in the morning, sowing seeds of kindness, sowing in the noontime and the dewy eve, waiting for the harvest and the time of reaping, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Verse two, sowing in the sunshine, sowing in the shadows, fearing neither clouds nor winter's chilling breeze. By and by the harvest and the labor ended, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Verse 3, Go then, even weeping, sowing for the master, though the loss sustained, our spirit often grieves. When our weeping's over, he will bid us welcome. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. And the refrain, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. And it repeats. Now, what are sheaves? Sheaves are those bundles of grain. They bound them up during the harvest time. And, um, and, uh, that is something I've never <laughs> had the experience of doing. I've not had the a time of harvest where we go out and bundle up barley or wheat or anything or whatever grain might be grown. But that is what sheaves are. And let's look up some verses in the Bible to help us understand that better. So let's first look at Psalm, Psalm chapter 126, and we're going to read verse 6. Psalm 126, verse 6. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Now that sounds exactly like the verse used for um, thinking of writing this hymn um, that has a lot of the things that are in a lot of the phrases that are in the the hymn. So let's also look up. So this is talking about rejoicing, bringing the sheaves. Okay. Let's also look at Matthew chapter nine. Turn with me in your Bible, Matthew chapter nine, and we're going to read verses thirty-five through thirty-eight. Matthew 9, 35 through 38. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. 
But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And that's you and me. We need to be the laborers going out into the harvest. Let's also look at the book of Luke chapter 10. Luke 10, and we're going to read verses 1 and 2. Luke chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Okay. And let's also look at the book of Galatians. Paul writing to the book, I'm sorry, Paul writing to the church in Galatia, writing the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians 6, and we're going to read verse 9. <clears throat> and let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season... We shall reap if we do not lose heart. So we are to be working and teaching the gospel. And Mr. Shaw here is making the connection of bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the harvest would be that we're bringing souls. We're bringing people to Jesus to learn more about the Bible and sowing would be teaching the gospel, sowing that seed, sowing the gospel, the seed, and bringing in would be the harvest time, would be when our work is ended. We need to bring in and teach the gospel, spread the gospel as best as we can. So even though we these days don't have sheaves that we're literally seeing or talking about, but that is what that hymn is teaching us, that we need to be those laborers looking for the harvest. Okay, now let's do another hymn. This hymn, I've always loved this hymn. Let the lower lights be burning. A, a really encouraging hymn. But it's talking about something that we really don't see often or that isn't used much anymore. Let the lower lights be burning. This was written by Philip Bliss, who lived in 1838 to 1876. He was a composer born in Pennsylvania he wrote a lot of hymns, a lot of hymns that we sing in our hymnals, um, such as More Holiness Give Me, Whosoever Will May Come, and he wrote the, um, the notation, the music that goes along with the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. He didn't write the lyrics, but he wrote the music for it. Um, he also died in a train wreck, as Noel Shaw did at a rather young age. Um, so that, that was a tragic thing. Let's read the verses and the, and the refrain to Let the Lower Lights Be Burning. Brightly beams our Father's mercy from His lighthouse evermore. But to us, He gives the keeping of the lights along the shore Verse 2, dark the night of sin has settled, loud the angry billows roar. Eager eyes are watching, longing for the lights along the shore. 
verse 3. Trim your feeble lamp, my brother, some poor sailor tempest-tossed, trying now to make the harbor in the darkness may be lost. And here's the refrain. Let the lower lights be burning. Send a gleam across the wave. Some poor fainting, struggling seaman, you may rescue, you may save. Now, I know that I have always sung this hymn and understood that it's making the correlation of watching for someone in a, in a difficult place in the sea to be the same as a sinner coming to Christ. I've always understood that part of the hymn, but I never knew what lower lights are. This is lighthouse verbiage that I don't know enough about, so I did some study. Lighthouses have existed since ancient times. And they are used, of course we understand that, they're used to send a light to let a ship know this is where a harbor is, a harbor or a coast, and it also lets them know of dangers such as rocks on the coast or sandbars or reefs. They need to know about that. But the lower lights are guiding lights separate from the main lighthouse and they're placed along the shoreline to help a ship maneuver through a narrow channel and especially at night at nighttime of course they would be lit at night to help them make it into safely into that harbor and now these um, words in the helm make so much more sense it's not just the light beaming from the main lighthouse. The lower lights are specifically to help a ship make it through safely through that channel to, to find the harbor. Never understood that before. Maybe you haven't either. And now, from now on, I'll understand better when we sing that hymn, Let the Lower Lights Be Burning. So, let's go over some verses. Let's get our Bible and go over some verses. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And let's read verses 14 through 16. Part of the Sermon on the Mount. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So we are to be those lights in the world. We are to be the Christians that Jesus needs us to be to be that light to others, to help them understand, to come to the Bible, to want to learn about the Bible, to share the gospel with them, to help them come away from the world, the dangers out there in the world, and come in safe to a harbor, safe into the church. We are to be those lights helping guide them along that's what this beautiful, inspirational hymn is making the, the, um, the adjustment, the, uh, the uh, parallel lesson to. I don't always get my words exactly right, but that's what I was trying to say. Let's also look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to read verses, <clears throat> verses 14 and 15. Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. 
do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Here again, we're being instructed. We live in this crooked and perverse world, but we need to be the lights. We need to be the ones showing others the light of the gospel, and we need to be the examples we should be to, teach, to help teach others, to teach others the gospel, to get the others out in the world to understand the Bible and that they will want to obey the commandments in the Bible. Let's also look at 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we're going to read verse 6. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So here's another way that we are being taught about light. Light shines out of darkness, and that light needs to be inside of us. We need to keep the gospel, keep the Bible message inside of us that we can help shine it out to others and help teach them the message. So, next time you sing this hymn, Let the Lower Lights Be Burning, let's think more about what it's really teaching us, what those lower lights are, and how important it is to get those out in the world to come in safely into that harbor, which would be the church. Get out of the world and come into a safe place. That's a beautiful hymn. I really love that hymn. Okay, and the last hymn we're going to look at today is... On Jordan's Stormy Banks. William and I were talking about this, <laughs> about this hymn. This is a hymn we both have grown up singing all of our lives. Why does it say on Jordan's Stormy Banks? We weren't really sure about that, but um, William, knowing music more than I do, he was saying maybe it's just it fit in with the measure that they were trying to do in the helm. I don't know. But on Jordan's Stormy Banks, this helm was written by Samuel Stinnant, who lived in 1727 to 1795. He was born in England. He was a Baptist preacher. And this is the helm. He wrote other hymns, but this is the helm that we tend to use in our hymnals on Jordan's stormy banks. Let's, let's read the verses and the refrain, and then we'll look up some Bible verses. Here's the verses of the song. Verse 1. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. Verse 2. Or all those wide extended plains shines one eternal day. There God, the sun, forever reigns and scatters night away. Verse 3. When shall I reach that happy place and be forever blessed? When shall I see my father's face and in his bosom rest? Verse 4. Filled with delight, my raptured soul would here no longer stay. Those Jordan's waves around me roll, fearless I'd launch away. And the refrain, we will rest in the fair and happy land by and by, just across on the evergreen shore. Sing the song of Moses and the Lamb by and by, and dwell with Jesus evermore. Now, we understand that this hymn is teaching about 
the River Jordan and crossing over the Jordan. Let's look up some of those things in our Bible. All right, let's first look at the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 3. Let's read Joshua chapter 3 and verse 17. Then the priest who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. Okay, here is the Bible account where Joshua is leading the people over the Jordan to take that land. And they crossed over on dry land, just like the crossing of the Red Sea. They crossed over on dry land, in dry land, on the Jordan also. Let's also look at 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 5. Another place where we learn of things happening in the Jordan. 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 10. This is the Bible lesson of Naaman the leper and what he is told to do. Chapter 5 verse 10. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. So here is the Jordan being used as a healing power. That's because Elisha told Naaman the leper to do it through the power of God. And, and if he did that specifically washed in the Jordan seven times, his skin would be restored. Let's also look at Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, and we're going to read verse 13. Matthew three thirteen. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. So Jesus was baptized in the Jordan to fulfill all righteousness not because he had sins to wash away, but he did it to fulfill all righteousness, which verse 15 goes on to tell us. So Jesus was baptized in the Jordan. Now, let's also, the refrain talks about um, singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Let's look up Revelation chapter 15, and we're going to read verse 3. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the Saints. Okay, so we've talked a lot about singing in heaven. And this, the refrain is saying, singing the song of Moses and the Lamb and dwelling with Jesus. So the meaning of this hymn is that we work here on the earth while we are given time here to be God's people and then we will pass on into paradise and heaven. This hymn writer specifically is talking about heaven that on the other side of Jordan, on the other, other, other side of that Sure will be heaven where we'll dwell with Jesus forever. We just, William and I thought it was kind of funny that it's Jordan's stormy banks. So anyway, we just, I thought we would just bring out some hymns that kind of have those archaic phrases, old fashioned phrases, and maybe let's just make sure that we understand a little bit better what the hymn is teaching us and study a little more about it and I encourage you to do more study on your own there's probably things I didn't think to bring out that you could bring out in your own personal Bible study 
So thank you for being with me today, trying to keep the lessons kind of short. And our next lesson will be on another hymn in our book, Singing with the Understanding. And please share the lessons and please give back some feedback, whether good or bad. I appreciate the good feedback, but if I misspoke or something I need to do a little more of, let me know. I would appreciate that. So until I see you next time, thank you for being with us and I hope you have a wonderful day today.